What is up guys, this is the Austin Show bringing you another Monday Night Rewind podcast where we hit the rewind button and go back 20 years and cover Raw from this week in 1998 and then we hit the fast forward and come into 2018 and cover the current news going on in the wrestling business. But first, as usual, we'll start out with the rewind section. So we're going back to February 21st. Well, technically it should be February 16th, 1998, but because of a dog show or something, Raw got preempted and so it was moved to a Saturday. So this Raw take pl- took place on Saturday night and it actually took place on February 21st, 1998. And this is Raw number 247 and it took place in Dallas, Texas. And so for the ratings, this show got a 3.0 probably because it being on Saturday night, you know, people are out busy doing stuff on Saturday. That is why their rating dropped this low, which I think this is their lowest rating. I can't remember what their next week one is, but I know from here their rating just starts to climb until they take over Nitro here in a couple weeks. So this is kind of the beginning. I mean, even though it's not on Monday night, but this is kind of the beginning of the end of the loss of the Monday Night Wars for Raw. And so as I mentioned, this took place on Saturday night. Um, So the show kicked off with the match of the LOD taking on the Quebecers. And so throughout the match, at one point, uh, Jacques, uh, Jacques, I can never say his name right. Jacques ends up doing a bunch of kip-ups just to show off when he has the upper, when they have the upper hand. He's just doing a bunch of them all in a row just to like show off to the crowd and stuff. And the crowd's booing him and everything. Uh, then at one point, Pierre ends up doing a cannonball from the apron onto Animal on the floor. So it's very similar to what like Kevin Owens does a lot now. Then as the match is going on, that New Age Outlaws end up pushing a dumpster down from the back like down the ramp to ringside and that catches Hawk's attention and so he starts to go towards them since he's obviously not the person in the match and they start attacking him and throw him into the dumpster and then the outlaws climb up on top of the trash can close the lids and then sit down on top of them so as they're sitting there um, throughout the match you keep seeing like the lids like bouncing up and down like animal or Hawk's trying to get out but since the outlaws are sitting on top of it they're not able to get out and because of this, the Quebecers in the match are able to just double team Animal and use distraction and stuff just to get the upper hand because they're the only two people fighting against the Animal. But Animal eventually gets the upper hand and he notices that the Outlaws are out there doing what they're doing. So he runs out, grabs a chair, and starts to run for the or head towards the dumpster to try to fight off the Outlaws. But they notice and end up just taking off running up the ramp. And Animal helps Hawk get out of the dumpster. They both get out and they just take up the ramp after the New Age Outlaws. And so by that, the ref counts them out for the 10 count, and the Quebecers get the win by count out. Then next up, we get commentary mentioning that DX is suing Stone Cold for emotional distress on China at No Way Out. And just to show what they mean, they then play a video package. So the first they play a video package on China just showing her whole career so far in the WWF from her first appearance till the current times. And then we get the footage from No Way Out. And so during the match at No Way Out, China ended up getting in the ring and she got up in Stone Cold's face and they were just kind of face to face staring each other down and probably Stone Cold talking crap to and everything. And she ends up shoving him twice. And so, of course, obviously Stone Cold doesn't hit her back or anything in between, but she shoves him twice. But he does eventually hit her with a stunner. And so because of that, that's why DX is now trying to sue Stone Cold for distress on China. Then we go to our next match of Ken Shamrock taking on Sniper. And so as the match is going on, Jackal comes out on commentary. He's not on a podium again this week. Uh, but in the match, Shamrock just keeps trying to do a bunch of different submission moves. But each time Sniper is able to get out of it or get to the ring ropes to break the hold. And so just kind of interesting that Shamrock's trying all these submissions now. But at one point, Shamrock gets thrown to the outside and recons out there and he starts attacking on Shamrock. But back in the ring, Shamrock gets the upper hand and he ends up putting the ankle lock on Sniper to get the win. And so Shamrock gets the win there once again. And so that causes Jackal to come in the ring after the match. And he just starts yelling at both Sniper and Recon. He slaps Sniper in the face and then does the whole turnaround thing again. Waiting to be attacked by him but it never happens. But Sniper and Recon are just angry about the whole thing. And they end up leaving the ring and heading to the back. Then we go to probably a commercial and come back. And JR's talking to Recon who's back in the locker room. And as he's talking to him, Sniper ends up coming up very short into the interview and interrupts and just saying, you know, that he's tired of all this and he's done with the Jackal and we don't need him anymore and stuff. So they're setting up the break or not setting up, but kind of going through the breakup here with the Jackal. So no longer going to be a part of the Truth Commission. 
Then we come back to the ring and we have Lawler doing an interview with Mark Marrow and Sable. So they come out. Uh, Marrow is just kind of here to vent his frustrations with Sable. And he's talking about how, you know, when he had knee surgery a while ago, while he was in the hospital, when he woke up from, you know, being knocked out, that Sable wasn't there. And he turns on the TV and sees that she's on Raw and she's prancing around in a Stone Cold t-shirt trying to sell that and stuff and that she cares more about doing that and being on TV and drawing attention than she is caring about her husband. And he continues on with saying, you know, that Sable isn't able to win matches and that all these fans here paid to see me wrestle, not her. And that her clothes are that she wears are way too provocative and she's just doing it to steal attention. And Lawler mentions the events that took place at No Way Out where Sable ended up pushing Mark Mara down. And of course, Mara wants to act strong and stuff. So he makes up an ex excuse saying that he tripped at that moment and that's why he fell down. And then while they're doing all this, flowers are brought out and delivered to the ring for Sable once again. And of course, that makes Mark Mara mad. And he starts sort of fit and asking what, who keeps bringing all these flowers and stuff. And Sable doesn't say, but she says, you know... I like getting these flowers because for once it's so nice that someone cares about me to get me flowers and stuff. And then she gets out of the ring and walks up and Mara's just kind of huffing and puffing and then mad about the whole thing. Then next up we get another Jim Cornette rant and he's talking about how when he announced that he was going to bring wrestling back to the WWF with the introduction of the NWA that people cheered and went crazy for it. But now every time they come out all they do is get booed. Well now the NWA is going to win this war against the WWF and that more wrestlers from the NWA will be coming into the WWF. And so he ends off their rant there. And then that leads into the match of the Rock and Roll Express, of course, coming out with all the NWA guys, taking on the Headbangers. And so before the match starts, Jim Cornette announces that Tommy Young be the ref for the match because he's an official NWA referee. So he knows all the NWA rules and stuff for the match. And so the match takes place, and at one point, Cornette ends up causing a distraction, allowing the Rock and Roll Express to get the upper hands. And then, but throughout the match, the Headbangers get the upper hand, and they go up to hit their finishing I guess double team move of a stage stage dive onto Ricky Morton but as they're going for the pin Robert Gibson starts to come in while Mosh notices and he goes over grabs a hold of Robert and throws him out of the ring while as he's doing that the referee notice and so the ref calls for the ending of the match and so everyone's confused and it's announced that because this is NWA rules and in NWA rules there's no throwing over the top rope and let, or you'll get disqualified so the Rock and Roll Express ends up winning there by disqualification because because one of the headbangers threw them over the top rope. Then that leads us into hour number two. And it kicks off with JR interviewing Stone Cold Steve Austin. So Stone Cold comes out. And I thought it was funny just to note that he was wearing a fanny pack at this point. So I just thought it was funny why he was wearing one. But JR asked him why he attacked China. And Stone Cold goes, you know. When you step through these ropes, you're in my territory, and she was lucky I didn't give her more last night. And then he turns his attention to Sean, how Sean's not there tonight, how none of the DX is there on this night. And he mentioned, you know, I hope Sean's at home, and he's all getting ready and prepared for WrestleMania. You know, being on, and he mentions like a bunch of like uh, workout equipment stuff. He's like, I hope he's doing that, getting ready for the match, because I want him to be at his best for WrestleMania. And then he says, and during the match, Mike Tyson better not stick his nose in my business because at WrestleMania, the shit is on it because Stone Cold said so. So he's just, you know, continuing on the build up for the WrestleMania match. And then he starts to leave or they start playing his music and the interview's over and JR starts to leave to go back to commentary and Stone Cold goes out, grabs the cowboy hat off JR's head and puts it on and he's standing up on the table doing his double hands in the air. And so I just thought that was kind of funny to end off. So he, then he leaves. And then that goes to our next match of Jeff Jarrett taking on Owen Hart. And so as Jeff Jarrett comes out, all the NWA guys come with him once again. And the ref ends up kicking out all of the NWA guys except Jim Cornette because Cornette's a certified manager. So he's allowed to stay at ringside, but everyone else is kicked out. But in the match, at one point, Jim Cornette ends up tripping Owen Hart. And then as Owen's there, you know, trying to go after Cornette for tripping him, Cornette jabs him with the racket. And so that allows Jarrett to get the upper hand. And then at one point, Owen gets thrown to the outside and Cornette's on the outside just kicking on him and stuff. But back in the ring, Owen ends up getting the upper hand and he pulls Jarrett over and pulls him crotch first into the ring post. And then inside, he puts the sharpshooter on him. But before Jarrett can tap, Cornette comes in and Owen notices that Cornette's coming in. And 
Owen releases Jareth and grabs Cornette and hits him once or something and then puts the sharpshooter on him and then is holding that on him and Owen ends up getting the win because of Cornette coming in and stuff so Owen got the win by disqualification. Then next up we got a video package on the history kind of of Michael P.S. Hayes and just kind of his backstory and then that leads up to Michael Hayes coming out to be the guest ring announcer or whatever for the next match. But of course as he comes out they announce him as Doc Hendricks and stuff. But Jair of course mentions that he's Michael Hayes and everything. But he comes out and he's dancing and he's singing the Bad Street song and it's playing. And he's just you know shucking and jiving as you could say. And he starts to introduce the next match but the lights go out and Kane's music hits. And so he comes out and Kane comes into the ring. And Michael Hayes starts attacking him and he takes off his boot and starts hitting Kane with it because that's a classic Michael Hayes move. But it has no effect on Kane and Kane ends up hitting him with the tombstone, taking him out. So that ends that segment. And that leads into our next match of Brian Christopher along with Pirata Morgan, which I know Pirata Morgan is what they call, or similar name at least, to one of the minis that's kind of dressed as a pirate and this guy's dressed as a pirate too. So I don't know what the difference, but he's like a normal size guy. And they're taking on Aguila and Takamichi Noku. And so Sunny comes out to introduce the match at first. And so at one point in the match, Aguila ends up hitting a spinning head scissors on Morgan, sending him to the outside. And then Aguila runs across the ring and does a corkscrew plancha out onto Morgan and Brian Christopher, who came out to help Morgan on the outside. And so he hits both of them with that. And then they end up getting back in the ring fine and the people switch out. So it's Taka taking on Brian Christopher. And at one point on the outside, Taka ends up hitting Asai Moonsaw onto Brian Christopher, who was on the outside. But back inside the ring, Taka ends up getting the win with the Michinoku driver on Morgan for the win as Brian Christopher was distracted by Aguila. Then we go to our next match of Fruit coming out with the Nation of Domination and he's going to be taking on Steve Blackman. But before that happens, The Rock comes out and he says, once again on the mic and of course talk and stuff, and he says that there are no issues going on with the Nation of Domination and to prove that he has some gifts for the Nation. And so he presents to Kama, D'Lo, and Mark Henry that he has some solid gold Rolex watches for them. And he says something about their like $15,000 watches or something along those lines. And presents it to them. And then he gives Farouk a, pic a gift of a picture of himself, as in The Rock. And he hands it to Farouk and Farouk's all mad about it. He's just angry about the whole situation. So the match starts. And so The Rock's standing on the camera side of the ring. So where the camera is like shooting at. And he's just standing at that side of the ring. And he just keeps holding up the picture and stuff. So kind of just showing it to the camera and everything. And at one point as he's holding it up, Farouk comes over as he has the upper hand. He grabs a picture and is getting ready to hit Steve Blackman with it and he has it held up. But as he's doing it, the rock gets up on the apron and grabs a picture and pulls it out of his hands. And so that causes Farouk to turn to him and allows Steve Blackman to get the roll up on Farouk to get the win. And so that, of course, makes Farouk even more mad. And so as the nation comes into the ring and stuff, Farouk grabs the picture and he just punches it and starts destroying it and just beats it all up. And the ro nation ends up grabbing a hold of the rock because, of course, the rock's mad for Farouk destroying the picture and so they're holding the rock back and fruit just gets mad and leaves and then the rock eventually is just trying to like fix the picture and flatten it back out and fix it then we go to commercial come back and michael cole's in the back and he's trying to interview the nation back in the locker room but d-lo ends up coming out of the door and he's just saying you know everything's fine and all families fight so there's nothing going on and of course as he's doing the whole interview you just hear a bunch of yelling and screaming and like bangs against the wall and door and stuff which i assume they were just standing on the other side banging and just yelling loudly. And so there's just kind of, you know, building up issues between The Rock and Farouk going on in the nation. And then that leads into our main event for the night, which is Goldust coming out with Luna and Mark Marrow. And they're going to be taking on Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie. And so I did notice that when Goldust came out that he was dressed in his normal, like, Goldust attire. He wasn't wearing any weird clothes. He wasn't dressed up as someone else or anything. But as the match is going on, the crowd just keeps chanting Sable to get at Mark Marrow and stuff because Sable wasn't out there. But she does eventually end up coming out to the ring and she's carrying the flowers. And she ends up setting them down because Mark Marrow starts talking to her and stuff and they're yelling back and forth at each other. And so she had set the flowers down. Well, as she did that, Luna comes around the ring and starts grabbing the flowers and then starts destroying them. She's like hitting them on the ring. She's biting them and everything. She's just completely tearing up the flowers. Well, Sable notices and that makes her mad. So she starts to go after Luna. 
but Mero just keeps trying to hold her back, is grabbing onto her, trying to keep her away from Luna, and she just keeps going for her. With this all going on, it causes a distraction of Goldust, and so that allows Cactus Jack to hit Goldust with a chair, because a ref was distracted at the time as well, and so Chainsaw then gets the pin on Goldust after that, and so Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie get the win there, and after the match, Sable and Luna come into the ring, and a bunch of referees come out, and Mero are in the ring, and they're all just trying to separate them and hold each hold them back from each other from fighting and everything again building up their whole feud there and even putting it in the main event and so that's it for raw 247 again that took place that's supposed to be on february 16th but took place on february 21st in 1998 and so the show once again wasn't that great i assume because you know you you don't have dx you only had stone cold in a promo segment you don't have the undertaker at all because he's gone and so you just don't have a lot of big matches or anything going on here at this point they're doing the whole um nation stuff and then the gold dust and mark marrow and luna and sable has kind of been like the biggest points on the show for the past two weeks and so like i said the show wasn't bad it just wasn't that good as it could be and will be but that's it for all this week so that's it for the rewind section we'll now be hitting the fast forward and maverick will once again not be joining us due to some health issues and stuff he's still going on with and so he will not be joining us this week so we'll hit into the fast forward section Okay, we are now in the fast forward section, and I'll just start off by saying not a whole lot of stuff has went on this week, at least nothing that I thought was really that big or um, stuff, so it's just hard to find. I mean, obviously, there's tons of wrestling news going on with WWE and all the independents and everything, but it's hard to keep track of everything, so I just picked the stuff that I thought was kind of like the biggest news of all that stuff. And so, as usual, we'll probably just go ahead and start with Raw and then SmackDown and then talk about some other news that's going on. So, we'll start off with Raw, and so we got some updates from there. So, from the main event of the night, we found out that Seth and Finn both ended up pinning Bray Wyatt in the, I guess, Fatal 5-Way match, I think it was, to be added to the last spot in the Elimination Chamber. But because of that, it was announced that both of them will be added into the Elimination Chamber, so both Seth and Finn will be in the Chamber, which I think is cool because I... Uh, Assume that Finn would have been in it um, from the lineup that was in that Fatal Five Way match, but then when Seth said he wanted to be or wanted to be in the match and Kurt Angle put him in, I was like, oh, with him Seth being in there, I have no clue who will win now. But they ended up adding both those people, so that's cool. But I don't know if they're just going to start off the match because usually you know you start off with two people, then there's four people in the pods, and then every so many minutes they release someone from the pod. So I don't know if they're going to start with three people since there's going to be an extra person, or if like Finn and Seth are going to be in a pod together like they're just going to be two guys in one pod at a time or I don't or there's an extra pod I don't know what they're doing I doubt the extra pod thing I think that'd be kind of stupid but I'm interested to see how they start it and I think adding both of them to the match makes the match a lot more interesting in my opinion at least because I like both of those guys and so it's cool to have them both have the chance for the main event of wrestlemania against brock but i'm pretty sure neither of them will win but you never know but i think that's cool anyways and then to kick off the show we have the match of cena taking on the miz and this was the miz kind of egged it on or egged it on on cena or whatever but they ended up having a match that whoever lost the match would have to enter the chamber at number one or be the first person in the chamber which of course if you're number one or two you're both starting out the match and it doesn't really matter. But they had the match and Cena ended up winning there. So the Miz will be the first person in the Elimination Chamber. So um, they're still building all these stories out of the Elimination Chamber. Which I think is really cool that they're doing. Mixing up all these guys together. And speaking of that we then got also had the match. Or I guess the little segment part of Braun Strowman and Elias. Which was funny because of course Elias comes out doing his normal stuff of singing the song and running down the town and everything and then you had jojo the ring announcer introduce ladies and gentlemen braun Strowman, which is the thing she always does for elias and the elias like stopped and was like looking around like why did she say that and it goes up to the ramp and braun there's a light up there and braun comes up on a stool and he's holding a big i think they call it a double bass but it's just a big like bass thing it looks kind of like a violin but it's really large and it one end sits on the ground and the people hold it and play the neck and stuff and then use like a violin um bow to play it and stuff and he's holding that like a guitar and he's strumming on it and he starts to sing a song and as he's strumming on it that breaks and falls apart all the whole strings and stuff and Brian just kind of made a look on his face and just kept singing the song 
which was hilarious. And then he came down to the ring and beat up Elias and hit him with um, a couple of power slams or something. And then Elias escaped the ring and started crawling up the ramp to get away. And Braun came out, grabbed the double base, went up the ramp, and then smashed it on his back. And so it was just an amazing segment. I love all this stuff they're doing with Braun, just making him a big monster that destroys everything. And it was just so much fun to watch and see that. And then kind of the thing that I guess is kind of a big news, but it kind of went unnoticed or whatever on Raw was that Kurt Angle also announced that Ronda Rousey will have her contract signing to be on Raw at Elimination Chamber. So that's kind of a big thing, I guess, that's going to happen. But for Raw, that was pretty much it. There was nothing really other big pieces of news that went on from that. Um, so then we'll move to SmackDown, which the only thing that was really there, which similar to Raw, was that, um, of course, there was going to be a match between Dolph Ziggler and Baron Corbin that I mentioned last week that was announced. And so whoever won would be added to the match of AJ, Sammy, and Kevin. So it would be a fatal four-way match with whoever won the match. But as it started, Baron never came out. And we go to the back and see that Sammy and Kevin were had attacked him. And then they come out and go to like attack Dolph. And they fight out in the crowd a little bit. And because of the whole thing, and Baron obviously ends up coming back out. But Sammy and Kevin are able to get the upper hand on each one of them. Because they take one out and then the other... And so then it's announced that instead that it'll be Kevin Owens versus Baron Corbin and Dolph taking on Sami Zayn. And then if each person that won their match, so if Dolph won and if Baron won, they would be added to the matches. And they both won their matches, so now Dolph and Baron were added to that main event match at Fastlane. And so it's now going to be a fatal five-way match at Fastlane for the WWE title. Which is interesting, but once again, I don't care about either of those two people. Um, I don't care if they're in the matches or not, especially the one I care least amount about would be Dolph Ziggler, which then he's the next part of the news, which it was announced this week about him re-signing and his new contract was a really, or information was released by people like Dave Melter and all the news sites and stuff. Um, but it was just announced that he has signed a new multi-year deal, which supposedly for a lot of money, I saw a number saying of 1.5 million a year, which for Dolph. To me, that's definitely a lot of money. He deserves maybe point the point five of that, so five hundred thousand a year. But I guess you know, for WWE, if they want to spend that kind of money on Dolphin stuff, they have all the rights to, and so because it's their money. Um, but it's in the contract. The big parts noticed or pointed out was that he'd still be able to work on his outside projects. So I know he's working on like acting type stuff, and he has comedy stuff that he's doing. And so he has the ability to continue working on that as long as it doesn't interfere with his WWE schedule. And then he has the right to leave the shows after he's done with his matches or when he's done with whatever he's got to do at the shows. So he doesn't have to stick around and wait through the whole show. He can leave whenever he wants after his stuff is done and then some of the other news that we have going on um some one thing that i thought was kind of interesting and that was brought up or noticed because stuff was being sent out to people that have bought tickets for shows that the pay-per-views that are coming up after wrestlemania are no longer being labeled as a single brand show so you know it's not going to be a raw show or it's not going to be a smackdown show that they're going to be now co-branded shows now nothing's been like officially announced or stated you know that there's not going to be any single brand shows which I'm fine with this because I think having both, I mean, it's not good for the guys because now there's going to be less people on pay-per-views. But I think, you know, just holding off all sorts of matches and feuds and stuff because, you know, this guy's on this thing, this is, guy's on the other. And they can't ever interact with, except for, you know, the like big four pay-per-views or Survivor Series or whatever. So I like guys possibly being able to interact more and having guys from both shows on pay-per-views and possibly that cutting down to one pay-per-view a month would be a lot better for, you know, watching and getting exhaustion out of wrestling by having so many pay-per-views a month and everything. And along with that, we have the stuff of, you know, of course, the new draft that's going to be coming up after WrestleMania. At least I think that's when they're going to wait till at least I Denver saw a clarification on that if they're waiting or going to do it sooner, which I think sooner would be kind of stupid with WrestleMania coming up and everything. But so I think there's just they've seen, you know, numbers and analytics and stuff and decided that it's probably not the best to have two separate show pay-per-views every month and that to have the people separate. It's better to have a star-studded show than it is two shows with, you know, a one star, not one star match, but like one match with stars and stuff. So they're going to kind of spread it or put it more together and make it, I think, possibly better. 
Um, another piece of news was announced from New Japan because of their new shows. I think it's the new beginning shows that are still going on that I've mentioned the past week or two. Um, but they have the shows going on still, and it was announced at the end of the show that there was a video that came up of Rey Mysterio, and he's going to be taking on Jushin Thunder Liger at the March 25th New Japan show, Strong Style Evolved, that's taking place here in America and California. It's the next uh, show here in America. Again, it's in March. And so that was has so far been the only match announced for the show, and it's I think that's cool. Rey Mysterio taking on Juice and Thunder Liger, both guys that are probably the biggest names in like cruiserweight for their countries. And so you know Rey Mysterio from the American side, Juice and Thunder Liger, which is the Japanese biggest like Japanese kind of cruiserweight guy. And so having a match between them, which they had a match at I think it was the '96 Starcade for WCW was the first time they've ever faced each other. I don't know if they have since then, but um, I think it'll be fun to see. I mean, I know Jushin Liger's kind of old, and Ray, as we saw from the Royal Rumble, he still looks awesome and can still do a lot of cool stuff. Um, but I think it'll overall be a good match, so that'll be kind of interesting to see how it goes down there and, their, of course, their next American show, which would be cool to see, but I don't know if all have any way of watching it but we'll just have to see when the time comes if they introduce anything new and that's pretty much it for the news but i did want to say i did see right before i started recording that the news came out that wwe has officially released rich swan which of course a couple weeks or i guess months ago now he had been arrested or had issues with domestic violence or something against his girlfriend or wife whatever and so wwe had suspended him for that and i guess because new stuff coming up or just in general they've decided to release him and it was announced today that he's officially been released so rich Swan is no longer with the company which i mean i don't care i mean it sucks for reasons you know of domestic violence you know that stuff's not good at all but I don't really care. He's a 205 guy. I thought he was entertaining. I liked his song and the way he danced and stuff like that. But other than that, I didn't really care much about him. I didn't like find a reason to care for him or anything. But I think that's it for the news. Kind of a lackluster week. I saw, of course, a lot of news has come out of, you know, like people showing up in this company and all sorts of stuff. But there's so much going on and it's just small little tidbits of news. So it doesn't really make much difference. And, of course, new stuff is just coming out. So don't want to jump on it with now, you know, could be nothing, could be something you never know, or could be even bigger news. Um, but that's going to be, I guess, for the fast forward section. I start, it, It's kind of shorter this week, I guess. But when there's not much news and it's just me, it's going to be kind of shorter. Um, so hopefully at some point here in the next week or two, Mav will be coming back on just to get his opinion on some of this stuff. But hopefully if he gets better and everything. But that's going to be it for the Monday Night Rewind podcast this week. Kind of a shorter episode overall. Raw wasn't that interesting. And then, the like I said, there wasn't that much news in the fast forward section. But I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Don't forget you can find it on iTunes and SoundCloud under the Monday Night Rewind podcast. And don't forget you can subscribe there on iTunes or the Apple podcast, whatever you want to call it. And you can find the episodes on YouTube under Awesome Nerd Show where we then every weekend have the Monday Night Rewind release so that you can find the playlist stuff there if you want to listen to the older episode stuff because they're not all on the podcast website and stuff so you can find them there if you want to go back and listen to the past episodes because this is episode 30 and stuff so we have 30 episodes that have happened so far so you can go back and listen to them and don't forget you can help support the show on Patreon or buy a shirt from Teespring to help just support the channel and help it be, be able to afford some new equipment and everything. And don't forget to follow us on social media where you can keep up to date with what's going on on the channel with new videos. And you can talk to me if you want to. I don't have many any friends, <laughs> people to talk to. So having someone to talk to would be cool and stuff, especially on social media. So you could do that if you want. But don't forget to do all that stuff for me. But I thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed this podcast and we will see you next week. <laughs>